Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you. I hope everyone is doing well. This morning I get the privilege of being here with you while Pastor Mark is in Texas getting to be grandpa for the weekend, so he's excited to get that new t- time with the new little grandbaby. So he will be back with us next week. But this morning, if you've got your Bible, um, go ahead and open up with me to the fifth chapter of Matthew. We are going to be looking at some verses that we recently studied in our student ministry as we've been working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. Um, And as I was thinking about what I wanted to preach on this morning, these verses just kept coming to the forefront of my mind, and I think that there is some great stuff here that we can learn from these verses and some things that I think that we can grasp and take away. So if I were to be totally honest with you this morning, I'm teaching these things as much to myself as I am to you, so I hope we can all um, gain something this morning as as we see that no matter how hard we might try, there are things that we can never accomplish on our own, that there are things that only Christ can do in us and through us and I thought that song that we sang was the perfect song to kind of lead into this as we think of this idea of yet not I, but Christ in me. So if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 17 through 20 together this morning. And it says this, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is God's word. Let's pray together before we dive into what we're gonna look at together this morning. Father, I, I pray that over these next minutes as we study your word that you would just give us open hearts and open minds to hear what you have for us to reflect on our lives and see areas where maybe there is growth that can happen, areas where maybe we've been striving on our own to do things that only you can do. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so I'm going to be 100% honest. We're going to spend very little time on verses 17 through 19, and we're going to spend the majority of our time looking at verse 20. So we will quickly get to that point, and then we will spend most of our time this morning looking at verse 20. But before we do that, I want to kind of catch us up to where we are at this point, because I think it will help us to understand exactly what Jesus is doing here in these verses if we understand what comes before these verses. So up to this point, Jesus has been going to some pretty great lengths to lay out the character of the Christian. And we see that in the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 5. And these things Jesus tells us, these characteristics, these traits, are to mark the life of all believers. Let's look there just really quickly as a way of seeing what has come before it says, So seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountains, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. So that introduces what is now going to be three, basically three chapters of a continuous teaching of Jesus. And it says, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So here are the things that Jesus is saying that the life of all believers should look like. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. 
Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So those are the characteristics, the things that Jesus should say, says should be a part of the life of every believer. Then in verses 13 through 16, Jesus said is, says, if you are living as my follower, if you are doing the things, living the things that I just described to you, then this is what your life should look like in relationship to the world. In other words, this is what your life should look like towards non-believers, towards those that aren't following Christ. Verse 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives life to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So they are to be salt and light, and the reason that they're supposed to do that is so that those that aren't followers of Christ will be drawn into a relationship with him as well. I wish we could spend some time talking through what all of those things look like, but what I want us to look at this morning is I want us to focus on what Jesus tells them next. What is it that Jesus says after laying out those instructions for his followers? Starting in verse 17, Jesus is going to begin to unpack the idea of what makes all of this possible. And as he does that, he's going to introduce us to a theme that is going to start to kind of be the primary theme or message throughout the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, and that is the theme of righteousness. Now in verses 17 through 20, Jesus is going to introduce us to this important topic of righteousness that both makes the life that Christians are called to live not only a command, but possible. It's because of what Jesus is about to say that not only can he command that these things should be prevalent in the life of a believer, but that they are possible that they can be in the life of a believer. Now, let's begin to look at what this looks like. Jesus is going to start here by addressing his relationship to something that would have been very important to his Jewish audience of the time. Jesus is addressing his relationship to what we would now call the Old Testament scriptures. In verse 17, he mentions the law and the prophets. And then in verse 19, he mentions the word commandments. And all of these things are dealing with the same idea. The law and the prophets and the commandments that Jesus is talking about relate to all of the, of the Old Testament scriptures. But I think it's important for us to pause for a second and remember that at this moment when Jesus is teaching this, this would have been all of the scripture that they had. Because at this moment, there is no New Testament. So Jesus is talking about his relationship to all of the scripture that they would have known about at this time. So Jesus is now going to begin to discuss his relationship to the Old Testament scriptures and what those scriptures now mean in light of his coming. So something about the Old Testament scriptures, Jesus is going to tell us, has changed in light of the fact that he has now come. Look at verse 17. It says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, 
but to fulfill them. Jesus says that he is the fulfillment of everything that they have heard about in their Old Testament scriptures. In other words, all of the Old Testament finds its fulfillment in one place, in one person, in Jesus. Think about what they have been expecting and waiting for if they understand the Old Testament scriptures. They have been waiting for the one that would fulfill the covenants given by God to his people. They have been waiting for the one that would keep the law perfectly and be the perfect sacrifice. And they have been waiting for the one that the prophets promised was coming to rescue the people. And Jesus' message right here is, you don't need to wait anymore. You don't need to look any longer. I am the fulfillment of all of that. Jesus' claim here is one of great importance because he is saying in no uncertain terms, I am the Messiah that you have been waiting for and looking for. But Jesus says that he didn't come to do away with the law. He says, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but that they might be fulfilled. The law and the commandments and the prophecies that are contained in our Old Testament have not gone away now that Jesus has come. But they have found their fulfillment. That, however, does not mean that they are no longer important or that they no longer have a purpose. Those that are followers of Christ are still intended to live by the law and the commandments of God. But now that Jesus has fulfilled those things, they are no longer an attempt on our part to kind of be made right before God, but rather to be faithful and obedient to Jesus, the one that has fulfilled the law and that has made us right before God. Now, if we were to continue in the Sermon on the Mount and make it over to chapter 7, we would see Jesus tell us what it looks like for his followers to live out the law and the prophets. Verse 12 of chapter 7 says this, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, if you're like me, you were probably hoping for like some really profound, like, do this, do this, do this, do this from Jesus when it came to how to do this, but I think it's important that he doesn't do that because it reminds us that the do this, do this, do this checklist thing isn't what saves us. He just makes a very simple statement here, right? He says, do to others as you want them to do to you. Pretty simple, right? Treat others the way you want to be treated. And Jesus says, that simple act is the law and the prophets. Which means that Jesus' fulfillment does not do away with the law. Because if it did, then there would be no reason for Jesus just a couple of chapters later to explain what it looks like for his followers to live them out. If Jesus were doing away with it, or if they were no longer important, he could have left that entire part out of what he was saying. But instead, he reminds them of their importance And he reminds them of what it looks like for them to live them out. Jesus makes it clear that the law and the prophets are not going anywhere. And why is that? Why is he making that statement? Because until they are completely fulfilled, they will not pass away. Look at verse 18. It says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, Not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. By saying this, Jesus is making certain that all people for all of time understand that the scriptures contained in the Old Testament are fully authoritative now and forever. Jesus may fulfill them, but that doesn't make them any less Scripture. They are still to be viewed as Scripture, and they are still to have authority in our lives. Jesus then is going to 
relate this to something that's going to help us see just how important he thinks these are. But it might be hard for us to understand what's going on here because we don't speak the language or understand the way that their language was written. And if you've been going through the Bible reading plan with us, Pastor Mark talks in the introduction to that plan about this idea of gaps. Gaps that maybe we need to bridge in order to gain a right understanding of the text. And here we see one of those gaps when it comes to language. Jesus says that not an iota or a dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. And we need to understand exactly what that means because it's going to help us to understand just how far this idea goes. So an iota refers to what would have been the smallest letter of their alphabet. And a dot would refer to just a, like a small stroke of writing that would either help to differentiate some letters that maybe look the same or to complete a letter. This would be like if we were to cross a T or dot an I. And Jesus' point here is that no matter how small or seemingly insignificant it may seem, none of the law or prophets, which as we already saw, encompass all of the Old Testament, is going to pass away until the time when it is completed. So Jesus didn't do away with the law. He rather was the fulfillment of what the law and the prophets promised and required. It is fulfilled through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, and it will be completely fulfilled at his second coming. There's this idea here that it is fulfilled in Jesus, but it is still in the process of being fulfilled. This is the idea of something like it's already but not yet. It is fulfilled but still being fulfilled at the same time. That is why none of it can pass away, because it's not completely done at this point. And when will it be completed? When is the time going to come when it is completed? When Jesus returns and all his followers are ushered into the new heaven and the new earth to live free of sin, worshiping God forever. It remains in place until sin is done away with completely and it is no longer needed. And it will no longer be needed because there is no sin. Because the law serves to show us our sin, which in turn should point us to Jesus. Galatians 3, 19 through 24 says this, Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if the law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. The law cannot go away because the law is what reveals that we are sinners, because we cannot keep the law perfectly. But Jesus came that we might be saved despite the fact that we cannot keep it, because he was the perfect law-fulfilling sacrifice that we needed. Now, if you remember, when we looked at verse 17, I said that those that follow Jesus are still to live by the law and commands of God. And now in verse 19, we see Jesus make this point very clear. He says, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same 
will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Because of the fact that Jesus has not done away with the law and the prophets and the commands of the Old Testament, that means that his followers must keep them and follow them. Jesus is clear that to relax even the smallest one of these things and to lead others to do the same will have an effect on our standing before God. Now it's important to note here something that we will see very clearly in the next verse, and that is that it is not the keeping of the law and commandments that is affecting their standing before God. Their keeping of the law and the commandments rather shows their heart. It shows the truth about them. Think about it like this. If they were right with God, then they will desire and be striving to do what Jesus is saying. And if they aren't, then they won't be doing those things. Their relationship with Jesus and their standing before God will be evident by the way they either live by or simply turn a blind eye to what God has commanded. As Christians, our desire, the thing that we're striving to do, should be to live like this. And we're able to do that because of the work of the Holy Spirit in this. The Holy Spirit is working into us to help us to grow, to be able to do this more and more as we seek to be more and more like Christ. Verse 19 also teaches us that while Jesus may not have done away with the law, they nonetheless will be applied differently because he has fulfilled them. The way we interact with and keep the law is now different because Jesus has fulfilled the law. We now live by the law not to try and make ourselves right with God or to save ourselves, but to show that we belong to the one that completed it. Jesus has not done away with the law, but has made it to where it is applied to us differently and we interact with it differently because we now understand that Jesus alone can save or that Jesus alone can keep them perfectly. Jesus wants his followers to keep all of the law, both big and small, with equal conviction. Despite their fulfillment, they still have a role in the life of Jesus' followers. Now, why can Jesus fulfill the law? What is it about Jesus that makes it possible for him to fulfill the law? And it's because he was perfectly righteous. In other words, he kept the law perfectly. He lived without sin. Now, why does that matter to us? Why Why does that matter to us at all? Because in doing so, he provided a way for us to be righteous as well. Verse 20 is an important reminder for both Jesus' audience and us today. It is in this verse that we're going to see our topic of righteousness be introduced and kind of come to the forefront. And righteousness refers to the quality of being right or in right standing. So when we say we are righteous, we are saying that we're in right standing before God. Our sin made it to where we were no longer in right standing before God. But if we are righteous, then that has been restored and we're in right standing before God again. Verse 20 helps us to see the importance of the righteous life it says this for i tell you unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and pharisees you will never enter the kingdom of heaven jesus is doing something here that i think is really important for us to grasp he is reminding us and telling us that there is a difference 
between righteousness and religion. Now let me tell you what I mean by that. It's very, very easy for someone to look religious. We see that in the example given here about the scribes and the Pharisees. They appear like they have it all together because not only are they striving to keep the law as Jesus had just reminded his followers to do, but they would have also been doing all of these other things that a good Jew of the time would do. Now, this is not the only time where Jesus gives a warning about the religious look of the Pharisees. Matthew 16, verse 6, he says this, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus says, don't be fooled. Look out. They look good, but it's just a look. They don't have it all together like we might think that they do by just looking at the way that they live their lives. Now, I think it's important for us to stop for a moment and think about what this might look like today. Because it's really easy for us to read something like that and say, oh, well, they, they missed the mark. But think with me for a moment about some of the ways that we see this, even in our own circles here. We see people that go to church every Sunday and are a part of every community group, and they come to every study that we have and every event that takes place. We see people that read the Bible and they know some really awesome things about God. We see people that live a good life in their words and deeds. We see people that by their own strength, they're striving to live the commands of God. And from the outside, they look religious and they look like they have it all together. But on the inside, on the inside, they are just like what Jesus is warning about the scribes and Pharisees. Which is what? What is Jesus warning us about? Even though they may look like they have it all together, their hearts are still impure. That is where the difference here comes in between religion and righteousness. We can make ourselves look religious, but we cannot make ourselves righteous. We can do all of these things under our own strength, but we can never do it perfectly. We can check everything off the list of what we've decided it looks like to be a Christian, but that will never save us. Romans 10 verse 3 says, For being ignorant of the righteousness of God... And seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. They were ignorant to the fact that God was righteous, and they were trying to make their own righteousness, which was something that they could never, ever do. If we don't have God's righteousness, we will never be righteous, because no one can make themselves righteous, because no one can keep the law of God perfectly we can do all the right things we can look religious but unless our sin is forgiven and our hearts are changed we will never be viewed by God as righteous why because righteousness is not something we can do it is something we must receive only through Jesus will we be made righteous When we repent of our sin and place our faith in Jesus, we receive something we could never have gotten on our own. We receive the righteousness of Christ. It's through repentance and faith that we are made righteous, not the empty, legalistic, religious acts that make us look good. Apart from Christ, we can never be righteous. Romans 3, starting in verse 9, says this, What then? 
Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be, account- be, may be held c- accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? Is it excluded? By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Paul is making a point here that parallels that of what Jesus is saying in the verses we were looking at. Works of the law can never save anyone. No one except Jesus ever kept the law perfectly, which means that only Jesus is righteous before God. But that does not mean that we can only be made righteous if we keep the law. We are only made righteous through faith in Jesus because only Jesus is righteous. Our good works and our keeping of the law is not what makes us righteous. But that does not mean that those that have been made righteous through faith in Jesus are just to ignore the law. The law does not save. Our religious Look does not save. But when we have received the righteousness of Christ through repentance and faith, we will, because of our desire to be obedient to God, live out those things. Jesus may have fulfilled the law, but that does not mean it goes away. As his followers, we are to live by his commands, not to save ourselves or to make ourselves righteous, but out of a desire to live the life that Christ has called us to live. Religion does not save us. Jesus saves us. And he gives us his righteousness through repentance and faith. That means if we are in Christ, if we have been saved through repentance and faith, When God looks at us, he no longer sees our sin, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees, they looked like they had it all together. 
But Jesus' warning is clear. They have completely missed the mark. They look religious, but they are not righteous. Why? Because they're trying to save themselves. They're trying to do it all on their own. We must come to a place where we stop trying to save ourselves by looking religious and turn to the only one that can save us because he alone is righteous and that is Jesus. Otherwise, we will be just like the scribes and the Pharisees. We will look religious, but our lack of righteousness will cause us not to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but For me, this was somewhat of a relief. (laughs) And the reason that it's somewhat of a relief is because I often look at my life and I, I don't even look as religious as the scribes and the Pharisees because I'm not living by God's commands and doing these things as well as I would like to. But the really awesome news for you and for me is that it's not about the life we live, but about our relationship to Christ. It is through Jesus that we are made righteous. We don't have to save ourselves. Jesus has already done that. That should be such a great hope for us that our righteous standing before God is not about us, but about Jesus. If we are in Christ, we have right standing before God because of the righteousness of Jesus. How awesome is it to think that even a us as sinners, as people that could never earn any of this, can be seen as righteous before God. Not based on anything that we've done, not based on deserving any of it, but based on our relationship to Jesus. And when we are in Christ, I want us to see how Paul says that God sees us. Colossians 3 verse 12 says this, but put on then as God's chosen ones, and here's how God sees us, holy and beloved. If we are in Christ, God sees us as holy and beloved, not as sinner, but as holy and And beloved, not because of our works and deeds, but because of the saving work of Christ and his righteousness that we have received through repentance and faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 16, says this, For from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God saves us and makes us righteous through Jesus, not because we deserve it, but because of his love for us. And when we are saved, when we are saved, we are new creations. Our past life of sin is washed away and we are made new to live the life that followers of Jesus are called to live, not by our works or our own strength, but because God sent his son to die for us that our sin might be forgiven. Now you may be wondering, you may have some questions, and I I 
will admit that I think in this way too. But how does this fit with Christ's command in verse 19 to keep the law, with the lifestyle that is laid out for us in the Beatitudes, and with the command to be salt and light in the world? I mean, aren't all of those things works? And the answer is yes, all of those things most definitely are works. But the key is in understanding what those works accomplish, what those works show. These works and commands that Christians are called to have nothing to do with accomplishing our salvation. Let me say that again. These works and commands that Christians are called to have nothing to do with accomplishing our salvation. Salvation is through faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. There is no greater truth in all of Scripture than that truth about our salvation. That it is through faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. Travis read this verse earlier, but I'm, I'm going to read it again because I think it's so important for us to understand. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 say, For by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. These works are not what saves. Only Jesus can save. So if you're here this morning and you've been trying to save yourself through your own actions and strength, then I want to challenge you and encourage you, stop trying to save yourself and allow Jesus to do what he alone can do. If you repent of your sin and place your faith in Jesus, you will be saved. Despite your sin and not based on your good works or anything that you have done, it is only available because Christ died to save you. If that is you and you have questions about that, if you're that person that's been trying to save yourselves, there'll be some people up here at the end of the service, some of our community group leaders that would love to help you understand what it looks like to truly repent and believe so that you can stop trying to earn your salvation and you can receive the free gift that is only available through repentance and faith in Jesus. Now, if these works and commands are not what saves us, I think there's two questions that we need to answer as we kind of wrap this up this morning. If these works and commands are not what saves us, what do they do and why do we do them? These works and commands that we see prescribed for those that are in Christ are done to show that we have been saved. And we do them out of obedience to what Christ has called his followers to do. These things that Christ's followers are called to serve to show that we have been saved. They serve to show that we have been made righteous. And they serve to show that our lives have been changed and we are now living for him. When we are saved, our lives are completely changed. And what Jesus is laying out is the life that we are now instructed to live in order that others will see that we are his and can be drawn to him as well. These things are an act of obedience toward the one that has saved and to the one that we are now living our lives to follow. It doesn't save, but shows that we have been saved and that we are living for the one that saved us. So I have some questions that I want you to ponder as you go this morning, reflecting on your own life and where the way these things play out in your life. And the first one is this. Have you been trying to save yourself by your good works and by your keeping of the law? 
If that is you, the time is now to stop trying to save yourself and to allow the only one that can save to save you. And then for those that are in Christ, that are following Jesus, does your life show that you have been saved? Is there evidence in your life that you are a follower of Christ? Are you living like what a follower of Christ is supposed to look like? Salvation through repentance and faith will lead to life change, which leads to living in obedience to the law and commands of Jesus. It's all because of God. He saves us and he sanctifies us so that we can live in this way. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for the tremendous truth that our salvation is not because of our works or because of something that we have done. It is all because of your love for us. Love that sent your son to die for us that we too might be righteous despite our sin, despite the fact that we constantly fall short. You sent Jesus to save us. Help us, Father, then to stop trying to save ourselves and to allow Jesus alone, the only one that can save, to save us. And then give us the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives to help us to live the life that your word calls us to live. We praise you and glorify you for all that you have done in accomplishing our salvation. Thank you for sending Jesus and for pouring out on your people grace that we could never deserve. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.